Chapter 12 On Divine Revelation as a Past Experience of Men and as a Present Need of the Human Mind We have shown in what has been said in previous chapters that our relation to God is a vital one, in other words, that our life is a perpetual derivation from the Divine Being. But is it not equally true of our knowledge? Could we any more think without God than we could live without Him? A revelation of knowledge from Him is no more unreasonable in itself than a communication of life from Him, since mental action is the highest form of vital activity. All genuine knowledge, in philosophy, in science, and in religion, is, in a proper sense, a revelation from the divine mind. Here is its sempaternal source. The essential element in the idea of a revelation from God is that some truth is made known to us from Him. The word revelation from re and velo, in unveiling and uncovering, has been defined the act of disclosing or discovering to others what was before unknown to them. And in its religious application, it is the disclosure or communication of truth to men by God Himself. But is there any truth that does not come from Him? As the radii of a circle lead us back to the center, so every ray of knowledge has an unbroken connection with the central sun, the divine wisdom, and the revelation of it is only our coming to the perception or conscious reception of it. Theologians speak of the scriptures as containing a system of divine truth. All other knowledge is viewed by them as comparatively profane and lacking the quality of sacredness. This is too narrow a view and places an obstacle in the way of our spiritual growth. We ask the intuitive reason of every man, is such a distinction justifiable? Is there any truth that is not divine? Is not all truth sacred? The mischief of such a distinction lies in its immoral tendency and calls sing in the public mind a too low estimate of the value of truth and of an undeviating truthfulness in our everyday life. All truth should ho viewed as a divinely sacred intellectual treasure and all falsity as infernal. The one is the light of the angelic heavens, the other is the darkness and foul emanation of the abyss. On this subject, Morel, in his excellent work on the philosophy of religion, judiciously remarks, the idea of a revelation always implies a process by which knowledge, in some form or other, is communicated to an intelligent being. For a revelation at all to exist, there must be an intelligent being on the one hand to receive it, and there must be on the other hand a process by which this same intelligent being becomes cognizant of certain facts or ideas. Suppress either of these conditions and no revelation can exist. The preaching of an angel would be no revelation to an idiot, and a Bible in Chinese would offer none to a European. In the former case, there is no intelligence capable of receiving the ideas conveyed. In the latter case, the process of conveyance renders the whole thing practically a non-entity, by all owing no idea whatever to reach the mind. We may say, then, in few words, that a revelation always indicates a mode of intelligence. This point should be carefully noted, and we must not confound the idea of a revelation as a means of communicating truth from one mind to another with the object revealed. If a revelation, then, necessarily signifies a mode of intelligence, we have next to determine what mode of intelligence or what form of knowing which the term revelation implies. There are only two modes of intelligence possible to man. They are the only two methods of acquiring truth adapted to the present state of the powers of the human mind. To conceive a third mode is a psychological impossibility. These are the intuitional and the logical and the former we arrive at truth by a direct perception of it truth is seen in its own light. It is thus self-evident, or proves itself. In the logical mode of intelligence we arrive at truth mediately, or as a necessary inference from other known and acknowledged verities. These two methods of knowing are the only conceivable ones. Sensation, which might be considered a third, is found to be not knowledge, but only feeling. Of itself it can give no knowledge. The senses of an idiot may be as perfect as our own, and those of some animals are far more acute, yet their knowledge is not in proportion. If a revelation from God must take place in harmony with the laws of the human mind and must be a direct showing of truth to our intuitional faculty, the question arises, can it take place now as well as at any former period of the world's history? Is man as capable of it today as some men were many centuries ago? These are questions of great interest to every human soul. Was it once possible, but has now become impossible? Does it not rather arise as a practicable spiritual experience out of the necessary relations that man sustains to God? that the finite mind holds, and must forever hold, to the infinite mind? Is it not needed as much today as it ever was? And, if so, will it not be given if it is possible? The soul cannot be satisfied with the dry, moldy, Gibeonitish crust of the past experiences of others, even though they were pious and semi-enlightened Jews, but requires for its nutriment and spiritual growth the living bread that comes down from heaven, in which, like the manna, is gathered fresh every day. 
the authors of all the separate tracts, poems, epistles, etc., which collectively constitute the book we call the Bible, are, at least, thirty in number. How many more there were we have no means of knowing, as the names of the writers of many parts of the volume are not given. These are supposed to have received a revelation from God. We admit it to be a fact, but what does the fact prove? Is it any evidence that no one else could? Do the writings of these men exhaust the supply of truth that could be made known from God? Or do they fully satisfy the spiritual needs of all men everywhere? It is certain they do not. If thirty men received a revelation of truth from God, in harmony with the laws of mind, it would only prove that thirty, or even thirty thousand, more might enjoy the same experience. God is not far from every one of us, and He will respond to our sincere yearning for truth by sharing the infinite stores of the divine intelligence with the thirsty soul. We would not undervalue that degree of truth which God made known in a way in perfect accordance with the laws of the human intelligence to thirty Jews in different ages of the world, and in sparsely scattered fragments along the stream of history. Place as high a value upon it as you please, or can possibly find in it. I admit it all. I would only enlarge the volume of divine revelations so as to include all truth, as has been done by Jesus the Christ when he says, Thy word is truth. All truth that ever came to man is a ray of the eternal logos, the uncreated word, the divine reason and wisdom, made available to finite minds. It is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The totality of truth is the word of God in its fullness. But if it should be written the world itself would not contain the books. The real word of the Lord is the God light within the soul and not a book. It was the theory of Malbranche that in our vision of the objects of nature we do not perceive the objects themselves but the ideas of them which are in God. God is so united to our souls by His presence that He may be said to have that relation of place to the mind which space has to body. Wherever the human mind is there God is, and, consequently, all the ideas which are in God. This theory of Malbranche seems to be only a modification of the doctrine of Augustine, which is the fundamental principle of his metaphysical philosophy that there is a supreme, eternal, and universal truth which is ultimately present to every mind, and in which all minds alike perceive the truths, which all alike are, as it were, necessitated to believe, for example, the truths of arithmetic and geometry and the primary, essential truths of religion and morality. These truths we feel to be eternal, because we feel that they are not contingent on the existence of those who perceive them, but were, and are, and must forever be, the same, and we feel also that the truth is one. Whatever be the number of individuals that perceive it, and is not converted into many truths merely by the multitude of believers, if, in discoursing of any truth, I perceive that to be true which you say, and you perceive that to be true which I say, where, I pray you, do we both see this at the same moment? I certainly see it not in you, nor you in me, but both see it in that unchangeable truth which is beyond and above our individual minds. This unchanging and everywhere present light of truth is what is called in the Scriptures the Word of the Lord, the Divine Logos, and by Jesus the Christ, the Spirit of Truth, which was promised to guide into all truth. The human mind in all ages and climes has been in communication with the sphere of the Divine Intelligence. The light of the heavens has leaked down, through the crystal dome and been caught by thirsty souls. The Jews and other ancient nations gathered and preserved some drops of the water of life, as Jesus symbolically calls the truth he preached, that fell from the ease of the palace of God. But there is much more to be obtained and treasured up by coming ages. Those eminent Christian teachers, Origen and Augustine, looked upon Christianity as only a fuller development of truths that had before been made known in a degree to mankind. And the gospel was viewed by them as directly connected with divine revelations at all times and in all places. On this point Bunsen remarks, the fact of a universal revelation of a continuity of divine influences, everywhere and at all times, remains as the anchor of the soul, as the rock of ages, on which Christ's church will be built. Some of the best of the philosophical Greeks recognized the influential relation of the infinite mind and life to the souls of men, as high a view as that entertained by the church, and even less narrow. Seneca distinctly declares, without God there is no great man. It is he who inspires us with great ideas and exalted designs. When you see a man superior to his passions, happy in adversity, calm amid surrounding storms, can you forbear to confess that those qualities are too exalted to have their origin in the little individual whom they ornament? A god inhabits every virtuous man, and without god there is no virtue. Plato entertained a similar view. In Menon he makes Socrates teach that actual virtue comes untaught. It does not come by nature, but by the special inspiration of the gods.